Ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers, tonight we have a lesson planned for you. We've got the good brother, Kashu Dan Knight, uh, the historian, and he's going to be touching on the American and African slavery. You're familiar with Kashu historian Dan Knight from Maccabees TV. You can also find him on his YouTube channel, Moray Yeshaya, and you've heard him on Hebrew War Machine Radio and Debate Talk for You on Blog Talk Radio, and you've also seen him on Maccabees TV. So, I encourage the family to get their pen and paper. They don't call this gentleman the historian for no reason, and everything will be factual. So, I hope you're ready, but Kashub, if you would, uh, shalom to you, brother. I'm looking forward to this information you're going to bring out, and if you would, please start your presentation, good brother. Shalom, can I be heard? Loud and clear. All right, let me know of um, anything, because I'm going back and forth with this in my inbox with different people asking questions about joining on. No but problem. if you're on live, giving honor and thanks to the creator and the maker of heaven and earth, this presentation that will be brought to you is not going to be as long as some might have seen, but um, the information is coming from scholars, Black scholars, white scholars, male scholars, female scholars. And I try to mix it up between the different races so it won't seem biased. And I try to mix it up with the different genders so it won't seem sexist. You see, so this right here is very important to let it be noted and understood. Now, for those who are able to follow along, and for those who actually happen to have some of the books that we will be reading, um... Just want to sit there and let it be noted. We're going to start, brothers and sisters, in this particular book right here. This book right here is called, because the cover got messed up, Before the Mayflower. Okay? Now, this particular book right here, brothers and sisters, is written by an author by the name of Laurent Bennett. Now, many black authors speak of him, and many black people or people in general do know of this man and his um, scholarship, and a lot of people quote him. So just like on Maccabees TV, when the brother of Priest Daniela was going over the fact that we as Israelites read books external to the Bible, this is not a myth. We do read many books external to the Bible. You understand? So let that be noted and understood. You will notice, and it's not to seem um, dogmatic, but you will notice in this presentation that there will not be one quote directly from the scriptures. Everything we're going to go over here will be external references. It's not that a brother is timid or lacks faith in using the scriptures in a presentation. It's just that most of us here, knowing ourselves as Israelites, already know and understand Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, from verse 15 all the way down to verse 68. You understand? But what we're going to do is go over the fact of external references concerning our enslavement. All right? So, one more time for confirmation. That was the intro. Can I be heard, brother? Loud and clear, good brother. We're going to go in this book here before the Mayflower, and we're going to start on page 29 and see what it says. It says like this. There were other ships, other Williams, other Antonys, and other... Isabella's. Now, when it says Williams, Antonies, and Isabella's, it is talking about the names that was given to our people during the slavery. Millions after millions. This is a story about these millions and the way they came to the Americas. Now, when it says the Americas, with an S at the end, it is speaking about what we call understanding as the Western Hemisphere, North and South America. This is a story about the merchandising and marketing of human beings. This is a story about the greatest migration in recorded history. The story of Antony and Isabella is only one act in a larger drama. So I want to sit there and have this as we go over this particular presentation right now to be shown. All right? It says what? The European... Slave trade, which began in 1444 and continued for more than 400 years. During this period, 
Africa lost an estimate 40 million people. So now we have to begin to know and see, according to this particular scholar, it is saying that the people in Africa that were taken out approximately was 40 million. Now, when we go over the presentation, you will sit there and see that there were some who state 50 million, 60 million, 80 million, as far as the Coptic Encyclopedia, which states about as many as 100 million. So we have to begin knowing and understand that the numbers and the figures that's being given. According to a book entitled From Slavery to Freedom, they estimate Brazil alone had about anywhere from 5 million to 18 million. That is a difference, brothers and sisters, of 13 million people. How do you have it to where 13 million people in one particular country during the slave trade is said to be unaccounted for? That we're going to go over in this presentation. But for the Israelites, let it be noted and understood, as we know and teach and understand, just as it says in Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, that the Most High will do what? We know what the quote is in Deuteronomy 28, 68. All right? So, as stated, we ain't going to use the site from the Bible, but the house of Israel, the children of Israel know exactly what it is. So when they got people um, talking about ancient Egypt, oh, we don't know if there was any slaves there. Let's just see what America is trying to do. Because for those interested, you got it to where they call it today the Tuskegee experiment. And that is to say they want to deny that the slave trade actually happened. Are we serious? And in books like the school books in some of them cases, like in the state of Texas, they want to sit there and state emphatically that the people that was working, quote unquote, if you want to call it working, were people that was brought not by force into the southern United States as captives. So we're going to go over this type of record to let it be noted and understood the reality of that matter. It says what? During this period, Africa lost an estimated 40 million people estimated means that they still figuring it out. Some 20 million of these men and women came to the new world. Millions more died in Africa during and after their capture or on the ships and plantations. So we have to know and understand what I just read came from the book entitled Before the Mayflower by Laurent Bennett Jr. page 29 that you added to where they said an estimated 40, 40 million, 20 million either died in the ships or they died on the plantations after they came up over here. So now we have to then sit there and kind of shut down some of the ideologies as we go along in this presentation. Yes, there were people of color or what we would call black people inside of what we call the Western Hemisphere prior to the Atlantic slave trade. This presentation is not to deny that. Just like when you go in that book written by Lawrence Katz entitled Black Indians. Yes, there were natives in this society that were Blacker than myself, if you ever see a picture of me. You understand what I'm saying? However, that doesn't negate the fact that there were millions of us people of color that was brought from Western and Central Africa via the Atlantic slave trade over to the Western Hemisphere. All right? So let that be noted and understood. I have another secular reference book, if you will. This book here is entitled The Slave Trade by Hugh Thomas. And I want to sit there and show a picture of it. This is the title, The Slave Trade, right? by Hugh Thomas. Now, why did I pick this book? Not to sound funny or nothing like that, but as a person who sit there and teaches inside of a college, I wanted to sit there and go into a college reference so that way we can sound and present ourselves without being haughty and arrogant as collegiate, that is to say, of college material. Now, on page 174, check out this part here and let's see what it says. It says the following, page 174 of this book here. Actually, before the new European settlers entered the African slave market, the business was initiated on the mainland in 1619. Now, I want to sit there and have this to be noted and actually seen because this is another issue that even some Israelites discuss concerning the 400-year issue that we're going to get into as well in Genesis 15. All right? So now here's what it says right here, right? In quote, it says, in 1619, John Wolfe, the Norfolk-born first recorder of Virginia, already a grower of tobacco, who had been recently left a widower by the Princess Pocahontas, noted, and this is what he says according to this, about last 
of August came a Dutch man of war that sold us 20 Negroes. Now, this being as stated in the year 1619, and it says there that according to that in Norfolk, which is in what we call the state of Virginia today, right, that there was about, according to that, 20 Negroes that was sold to him by a Dutch man of war. That becomes very important as we go on. It says this comment is usually held to be the first reference to the import of black slaves into what became the United States. Now, check this part out here. This is talking about what happened in the year that we famously hear about in 1619. But here, this scholar goes on to say this. Though in Philo, the Navarres, Menendez, the Avalis, and Coronado had all taken slaves with them in their expeditions of conquest in Florida and New Mexico. Florida is a state, just like Virginia is, in New Mexico, which is another state. The previous century, and it is unclear what transpired in 1619. Okay, I just wanted to have that to be noted because when they keep on pushing the idea, and it's not to knock those who were brought over in 1619, but if we keep on noticing, they always say 1619, 1619. That is due to the fact that in the year 1607, that is when Virginia became what you understand to be a colony. All right? And then, as we know, 12 years after that, in 1619 is when they brought what they call the um, first black people to there. But the colonies were set up by the British. Now, if we notice this as the author of this book, um, here it says, it says, Do Pinfalo, the Navarrete, Menendez, the Avalis, and Coronado all had taken slaves with them in their expeditions of conquest in Florida and New Mexico. So if that was done the century before 1619, that is to say that was being done in the 1500s, or that is to say the 16th century proper, we have to then know and understand that black people were brought to what we call places in the United States as slaves before the situation was 1619. So now for the brothers and sisters who are Israelites and saying that the year 2019 must mean something based upon the 1619 date, we can't go by that. When you go into Genesis chapter 15, when you go in there, it says, they shall be afflicted in the, in the land that's not theirs 400 years. That 400 years is talking about them being inside the land of Egypt, the first Egypt. You understand? Because how you understand that is because Joseph is of the seed of Abraham. He was afflicted there. And when he named his son Manasseh and Ephraim in Genesis 41, for those interested, you will sit there and see he knew that he was in the land of his affliction though he became a viceroy and he had respect or props in that land. When you go in the book of Joshua, it said that Joseph was in there, was beaten upon. And when you go, brothers and sisters, into the book and the scriptures, it said Joseph was incarcerated. So that right there is the land of his affliction. So now if you take it from the fact that Joseph and Levi were two brothers of the same generation, and then when you go to Exodus, the sixth chapter, it said Levi sired, who we understand to be Kohat, who, who sired, Amram, who sired Moses. That's four generations. And after those four generations, Moses and Joshua were the same generation, and they, under Joshua, went back into the land of Canaan, which later became the land of Israel. So Genesis 15 has to be understood that each of the 400 years, each 100 years represented a generation. That's an understanding of that. Because if we know and understand, trying to take that to today's day and time is not accurate. Because then you're forgetting the fact of the other European nations that enslaved our people prior to the 1619 date, during the 1619 date, and after the 1619 date. The slave trade did not start in 1619. The slave trade started under the British in 1619 in the United States. I want this to be noted and understood. The British started the slave trade in the United States in 1619, but yet, we, those who know, know good and well that Henry VIII, the father of Queen Elizabeth, who had a worker named John Hawkins, he had the slave trade going on when he was trying to rid the Spanish of monopolizing the slave trade in the 1560s. So that was still the same British people. So we have to begin knowing and understand that that was being done in the West Indies. Now, when most people speak about slavery, they don't speak about our people in the West Indies and Brazil. But we go into tonight 
Oh, we're going to get into that. Bless be the most high. So now, brothers and sisters, I want to go back, if you will, into this book here entitled Before the Mayflower. And we're going to go, brothers and sisters, on page 29, all right, yet again, so that way we can gain an understanding concerning this kind of matter. It says the following to sum it up. I did this like this in my notes for a reason, so we can cross-reference again. Some 20 million of these men and women came to the new world. Millions more died in Africa during and after their capture or on the sh ships and plantations. Now, I want to sit there and have that to be noted on purpose. I know I read it before, but the key word I wanted to point out in this is the fact that it distinctly says the 20 million approximately yet again in the new world. The new world according to who? The new world according to the Europeans. So that right there is something to let it be noted and understood. So we can't sit there and hop on repetitively the 1619 date when they speak of what they call the new world because it extended beyond what we understand as Norfolk, Virginia. All right. Now, let's continue on, if we will. Same book before the Mayflower. We're going to go, brothers and sisters, blessed be the most high, on page 32 so we can gain and understanding concerning this kind of matter. And it says the following. During the middle of the 16th century, Mary Wilhelmina Williams commented, the inhabitants of the Argrove are largely Ethiopians, and even as far north as Lisbon, blacks outnumber the whites. Now, when it says they are of Ethiopians, we got to remember, just like Tacitus, in the Roman historian era, he stated that the Jews or the Israelites were mistaken to say as Ethiopians. So the word Ethiopians, when you go into the secular book, um, African Presence in Early Europe by Ivan Sertima edited, he gets into the fact of saying that the word Ethiopia comes from the two compound Greek words, eti, op, eti and ops. Eti means burnt and ops means face. So etiop in the Greek means burnt face. So that's not a full-fledged national origin name. Just like Hyksos, Hakusho Sweat, just like the term Hebrew, that is a terminology that some people called another people. Just like the term Hispanic is a generic term. You're among the people who you will understand as being Hispanic. You got what you call Puerto Ricans, Dominicans. You got what you call Ecuadorians and Mexicans. You understand? And so therefore, it's a generic term that's thrown and cast upon a group of people. That's done all the time. And for the record, let it be noted, the people who were called the Fuensians did not call themselves the Fuensians. Okay, so let that be noted. The people who were called the Fuensians were called that. The people who were called the Fuensians were called that by the Greeks. And it comes from the Greek word for purple. Look it up when you go into a book entitled Archaeology by David Down. All right, so we're going to get our references out there. So let that be noted. Okay, it goes on to say the following. There was no marked color line, and the blood of the two races in Portugal, that is, mingled freely, resulting eventually in Negroid physical characteristics in the Portuguese nation. This is speaking about when the slave trade first started. All right? And the Portuguese brothers and sisters were the first ones to sit there and set that off in the year that we call some date as he does in 1444, some other ones dated as 1441, some other ones dated as 1440. But we have to know and understand that we're going to get into this presentation and show the evidence later on in the notes that the Portuguese were the ones who initially set off what we call the Atlantic slave trade. All right, so let's move on in this particular um, presentation. If we go on and it says this, I have a book here right? It is entitled, and I want to show the book here so we can gain a reference material for edification purposes. This book here is entitled Another College Book, all right? It is entitled A History of West Africa by Basil Davidson. Now, anybody who knows about the college of curriculum, Latin American studies, Afro-American studies, Caribbean American studies, uh, which basically in most cases is what you call electives, um, they used Basil Davidson a lot. All right. Now, in this book right here, we're going to go into what this scholar has to say concerning the slave trade so we can gain an understanding of what in the world that we're reading and what in the world that we're talking about. It says the following. 
Trying desperately to find new sources of free labor, the Spanish rulers began sending out Spanish people under conditions no better than slavery, but they could not find enough of them. Where else to look for slaves? The answer, oh, here we go. You ready for this one, people? Let's move on. Because we want to sit there and get this done because you got some characters out there saying that, oh, the slave trade never happened. So let's go on. And this one right here distinctly says what? The, right? It says this. The answer was West Africa. See? This is the answer for them to get slaves. Now, for those who are familiar with the history that we're getting into before we continue reading, right? There was a guy who was named Bartolome Las Casas. He was the one that in the year 1507, 1509, that said instead of slaving the Native Americans or the Native people, such as the Arawaks and the Caribs and the Taino people in the West Indies, let's go way yonder across the Atlantic and get people in the slave dump from Western Africa. The guy named was Bartolome Las Casas. Now, when you get into a book entitled Bartolome Las Casas, the story thereof by Penguin Books, he noted that the people that were being enslaved were the same, we're going to go there, the same Jews that escaped Jerusalem during the era of Titus. Let's move on. Okay, so now, one of the things to sit there and let that be noted is this. All right, it goes on to say, in this particular book here, where it says, where were they to go for slaves? And then it said the answer was West Africa already. And I want this to be seen for edification purposes, brothers and sisters. All right. And it says the following, right? It says already the Portuguese and Spanish had imported a few West African captives into their own countries. So they already was importing black people over from Western Africa to Lisbon, to Cadiz, which is in Spain, or Lisbon, which is in what we call Portugal, or to Madrid, which is also in Spain. So that was being done before the slave trade came over here to the Western Hemisphere. And that's the point I wanted to point out right there, because this right here just goes to show you, and it eliminates the concept of the 1619 date. Now, according to this same scholar, in this book right here, here's where we see, as we see Africa, the slaves being taken out according to this map, cheap merchandise, which included black people, over to European countries as slaves. So that right there is to be noted. All right, so I just want to sit there and have that particular thing, brother and sister, to be pointed out, if we will. Okay, now, continuing on in this presentation, right? It says the following. Now they were, now they began to carry West African captives to the West Indies and the mainland of the Americas. So it may seem monotonous, but I want this point to be driven home, brothers and sisters, because a lot of, not to sound disrespectful or offensive, a lot of black people, black Americans, quote unquote, um, don't think about the, our brothers and sisters in the West Indies when we start speaking about black people in general senses. They think, oh, we're black American, they're West Indian. And a lot of our people from the West Indies don't think about the black American when they speak in most cases, such as that's not my people and so forth and so on. And when did that ideology come big time? During the era with Marcus Garvey. Because when the man came far away from Jamaica to America in the 1920s and set up, actually before 1920s, and set up what he was setting up, the white people were saying, well, you know what? Tell the black people from America that West Indians are bad people. And then tell black people from the West Indies that black Americans are bad people. And so now with them trying to promulgate that idea over and over, we begin to now unfortunately look us through, our, through the eyes of those who don't like us. And it's a sad case. Now this right here I wanted to point out, it says what? It says, now they began to carry West African captives to the West Indies and the mainland of the Americas. So now, brothers and sisters, just to sit there and let this to be noted, we're going to sit there and go over a couple of more references concerning this kind of subject matter to let it be noted and understood in what we're talking about. The slave trade did not start in 1619. 
Check. The slave trade did not start coming to the Western Hemisphere. Check. Okay, so now we have to then know and know and understand what we're talking about. In this same book, the author goes as follows, and he continues to say the following if we continue reading on on the next page. It says this. Lastly, they had to be turned, they had to turn these captives or those who were still alive after the crossing of the seas into slaves. So it's saying that once these, as we see in this diagram right here, this common picture that's being shown is a British image of the slave trade. All right, so let that be noted. And it says this, lastly, they had to turn these captives or those who were still alive after the crossing of the seas into slaves. This too proved to be very difficult for the Africans resisted enslavement by every means they could. They broke out in revolt after revolt, led by heroes whose names we shall never know. They fought to the death. They spread fear and pain among the Spanish settlers. They went into the mountains or deep into the forest and formed free republics of their own. Now, we're going to get into what we just read because in Panama, they decide to refer to them as what they call the Cimarrones. In Brazil, they call them the Quilombo. And in America and in Jamaica, they refer to them as the Maroons. All right? So for those following the law, they know where we're going. Let's go on. All right? It says this. They made history in their fight for freedom. But Spanish arms and organization, together with the golden prophets of the slave trade, proved too strong. In 1515, all right, that date, very important. In 1515, the Spanish shipped back to Europe their first cargo of West Indian sugar, then an expensive luxury. And in 1518, another important date that we see, and in 1518, a grim date in the history of the Atlantic slave trade, the Spanish carried their first cargo of captives directly from West Africa to the West Indies. After that, throughout the 16th century, the slave trade grew rapidly. Now, just sitting there and having that to be noted and read, what I just read came from the book entitled, as we have shown, it is called A History of West Africa, right, by Basil Davidson. And in that particular book, on page 200 and 201, we just shown, brother sisters, from a scholar point of view, a college point of view, if you will, that um, the slave trade was done going to the Western Hemisphere by the Spanish in 1518. So why are people talking about a year, 101 years after that, was 1619? We're going to explain why further as we go along. Okay, now, brothers and sisters, to get into... um. This particular aspect right here, the Portuguese discovered, quote unquote, if you want to use their terminology, discovered what we call the place called Brazil in the year 1500, that is to say 1500 or 1501. And that was done by a guy named Cabral. He was shipping for the people of the Portuguese. The first slave ship to go to Portugal, brothers and sisters, directly was in the year 1538 still before the date we speak about being 1619. So that's important to let it be noted. So now we got two important dates in history concerning the matter we're speaking on. That is to say 1518, when the Spanish shipped people over from Western Africa to the West Indies, and then the Portuguese who did their thing in Brazil in 1538, that being 20 years apart. But as you just read in this book here, A History of West Africa by Basil Davison, it emphatically says that once the Spanish started it, it continued on and on. And if we read carefully earlier, we know and understand that the slave trade prior to going west went north. So let that be noted and understood. All right, now, brothers and sisters, when you get your own time, there's a book entitled History of Slavery by Suzanne Everett. And in that book, the author of that book, she speaks that in the year 1891, 1891, that the Portuguese destroyed their slave records. It states in there emphatically that the Portuguese destroyed, to the best of their ability, their slave records. So now that's why you sit there and see, in other references, they say anywhere between 5 million and 18 million, because many of those records were destroyed. Just like the Empire Papyrus of ancient Egypt speaks about them being slaves. And Empire 
the same thing dated to the Middle Kingdom of ancient Egypt, says scribes are killed and their writings are taken away. Just like the ancient Egyptians tried to hide records of them being slave masters, so did the European try to hide records of them being slave masters. Let's move on. Brothers and sisters, I have a book, Secular Reference, if we will. All right? This book is entitled, for those who are concerned, it is entitled Black Cargoes, A History of the Atlantic Slave Trade. Now, this book right here became a movie, but it is banned inside of the United States. Did you know that? But they show that movie in Italy, but they do not, brothers and sisters, show it inside of the United States because it don't make the people of the United States government look nice. Why? And it's not to sound disrespectful, but when you get into history, you will find out that Andrew Jackson, which was the seventh president of the United States, is noted as saying, we need to get rid of every trace of this bloody traffic of the slave trade as much as we can. I want to state what I just said again. Andrew Jackson, who was the seventh president of the United States, said concerning the slave trade that they need to do their best in the American government to get rid of the memory of it. So now you see Texas books in school saying that there was really no slave trade. They came over as um, workers of their own volition. This man is something else. Well, we're going to go in this book right here entitled Black Cargoes, right? And this is written by Daniel Mannix and William Coley. And on page 62 in this particular book, here is what we read for edification purposes, right? And it goes on as follows and says the same here. On page 62. In the first half of the 17th century, New Amsterdam, rather than New England, was the principal North American slavery center. So it says right here on page 62, what? New Amsterdam, that is what we call New York. Here we go. Yeah, New York. When you go into a book written by Adita Pigdow, it's a book that is entitled Hidden History of New York. They even got that book on Amazon. It talks about how Wall Street actually, um, not to get too personal, actually worked by the vicinity of Wall Street. And you would sit there and see what they have in downtown Manhattan. This is what they call the slave quarters. It still exists to this day. But they're going to sit there and tell people in Texas not know the slave trade that happened. All right, let's move on. It says what? In the first half of the 17th century, New Amsterdam, rather than New England, was the principal North American slavery center. In 1621, all the Dutch private slaving concerns were incorporated into the Dutch West India Company. When you look into your own time, Look up what they call Dutch West India Company. Dutch West India, W-E-S-T-I-N-D-I-A. The Dutch West India Company. And all kinds of references about the slave trade will pop up. It says what? In 1621, all the Dutch private slaving companies were incorporated into the Dutch West India Company. By then, Holland had firmly established herself in the Guinea coast and the West India Company had a full had the full support of the government. And this I want to have to be seen what I'm about to read for edification purposes, if we will. All right. And here, brothers and sisters, is what we read. It says the following. And okay. uh Kashu, good brother, I just wanted to let you know everything is loud and clear. And for the people's edification, in the video description, I will be including all the references to the books that you brought out uh, for this presentation, good brother. All right, Basim. Good. Thank you, brother. It says, from 1619 to 1623, the company carried 15,430 slaves to Brazil. Okay, but we're speaking about the Dutch going to Brazil. But I thought that Cabral, the Portuguese guy, is the one who discovered Brazil, according to Rankins, in the year 1500. So how do you have the Portuguese discovering, quote, unquote, discovering, because we know there were people already there. How do you have the Portuguese making a colony of Brazil, that is, in the year 1500, but in the year 1619 to 1623, you got it over 120-something years later after Portugal founded their own colony in Brazil, the Dutch doing slave trading. You know how? Because the Dutch and the Portuguese were 
fighting against each other in Brazil to gain control of the slave trade. That's how. The Dutch and the English fought with each other. The English and the French fought with each other. For those in listening, you have it to where in the year 1494, they call that the year of the Treaty of Tordesillas. Um, that is to say, Spain and Portugal came together and said, in 1494, we're going to divide the Western Hemisphere like this. And then when Portugal found out in the 1400s that they did not have what later on became known as Brazil, they decided to sit there and make their treaty to the court. The court got their decision from the Pope. The Pope decided at that time with the cardinals and the bishops, because remember, Spain and Portugal are Catholic nations. So they came together and they decided what will be given to the people of another people's land. Very important to let that be noted and understood. All right, so let's continue on in this. And I need this to be seen for edification purposes. It says what? If we will, from 1619 to 1623, the company carried 15,430 slaves to Brazil alone. In 1625, the first slaves were landed in New Amsterdam. 1625. That's over 20-something years before the date we want to sit there and bust up in a second. Now, yes, it's after 1619, but we have to know and understand that this New Amsterdam is what we call today New York. And the Dutch had our people enslaved in that place. All right? Or for me in this place, because I'm currently in New York. It says the first slaves, right, were landed in New Amsterdam in 16, in six, uh, and in 1652, the Dutch ship owners in the New World were authorized to trade directly from Africa. So here we got 1652, the Dutch ship owners in the New World were authorized to trade directly with Africa. Who authorized them to do that? I know I was talking as if I'm talking to a little kid, and I don't mean to insult no one's intelligence in this, but I went word for word, similar to like many of our parents when they upset, did I tell you to stop? And those in the old school know exactly where I'm coming from, but we're going to move on. And so the point I'm saying is this. Once it came down to this particular subject, it says what? In 1652, the Dutch ship owners in the New World were authorized. Who authorized them? The church. That's who authorized them. All right? It says, on November 19th, 1654, two citizens of New Amsterdam, John de Stroots and Dirk Piertz, Piertzen, obtained permission to sail their ship, the White Horse, to Africa for a cargo of slaves. 1654. The slave trade was already been established by the same people in 1619, through 1623 in Brazil, 1625, going to what we call New Amsterdam, today called New York. Brothers and sisters, this is speaking about the Dutch involvement. Let's move on, if you will. All right? Now, if you will, I want to get into a book that I have. Another reference book. It's a college reference book. It is entitled uh, A History of the United States by Paul Johnson. And here is what we read on page 4 of this very same book. It says, in the 1440s, exploring the African coast from their newly acquired islands, the Portuguese rediscovered slavery as a working continue commercial institution. The Portuguese, on page five of the same book, the Portuguese entered the slave trade in the mid 15th century. That is to say, we already shown the references about the Dutch doing it in the 17th century. I read this book after for a reason to show yet again that the Portuguese was doing it in the 1400s. The Portuguese entered the slave trade in the mid 15th century, took it over, and in the process transformed it into something more impersonal and horrible than it had ever 
been either in antiquity, meaning in ancient times, or in medieval Africa. That is to say that the slavery of the world was nothing compared to what happened with the black man, woman, and child, and what you call coming over here to the Western Hemisphere after being shipped to Europe itself. How does that become important? Because you have it to where, and it's not to knock anybody else's enslavement. Yes, they were um, Turkish women that were being shipped by the, um, that is to say, pardon me, the Russian women being shipped over by the Turkey guy, Suleiman. Yes, you had it to where they called the Barbary slave trade in which white people were being actually shipped over. Yes, you had it to where the British did kidnap Irish children and send them over as slaves to Barbados. Okay, so we're not sitting up here trying to denounce anybody else's oppression. But as a man of color, a so-called black man, it is important, as Malcolm X stated, my first priority is to the people that I belong to. All right? So and I am in no way, shape, form, or fashion trying to denounce that anybody else ever went through a Holocaust or went through something that was um, very traumatic. But as you just read in this book here entitled um, A History of the American People by Paul Johnson on page 5, it said that no enslavement can ever be compared to what happened with the enslavement of our people here. So that's one of the things I wanted to point out in reference with that. In a secular book, as we were crisscrossing our, um, or corresponding, our references, it says The Slave Trade by Hugh Thomas. Once again, all right, we're going to go, brothers and sisters, on page 170. Now, what we're about to do is go into two different college reference sources and correspond back and forth. And you will see why I'm doing it, brothers and sisters. Blessed be the creator as such. So that way we can sit there and shut down the lies. Some of the lies that has permeated among our people. All right? Concerning our um, being brought over here to the Western Hemisphere. If we will, it continues to read as follows. All right? In this book here on page 170, it says, The Dutch by then had also trading posts in North America. So I wanted to sit there and have that. Um, I was told that nothing could be seen but black. Okay. What reason why that is is because I simply had the um the um phone that I'm using on the um thing. Okay. But can I still be heard? No problem. Yeah, you're fine. Go ahead, brother. All right. It says this: the Dutch by then had also trading posts in North America. The first on you ready, people? Manhattan Island. Are we serious? The Dutch had slavery posts in Manhattan, according to this guy, who's never been really contested, Hugh Thomas, in his book. Yeah. Was set up in 1613. Sediments were also made in the Caribbean by the West India Company before 1630. Now, I already referenced what we call the West India Company before. All right. So now in that same book, it said that as early as 1613, you had it to where in what we call Manhattan Island, the slave trade was already going on. So we need to sit there and not knocking it repetitively. You understand? Don't want to beat as the same goes a dead horse. But we need to sit there and know and understand that the um, concept that they continue to try to push um, about the 1619 date is, um, is not too, too accurate. All right, so let that be noted and understood. Now, after reading that, we're going to now, brothers and sisters, get into back into this book here entitled Black Cargoes. And you will see why I'm going book to book, book to book like that. Okay, here's what we read. It says, they returned, speaking about the Dutch, that is, they returned the next year and the slaves sold for an average of 125 bills in Dutch currency each. The slaves were in each were in such poor condition that some dropped dead before their new owners could get them home. Four years later, the oak tree set out. Likely nearly all the early slavers, she was a small craft, 120 feet long, 25 and a half feet wide, and with gun wells a scant of 11 feet above the water but she could carry 350 to 400 slaves at a time. How successful she was, we do not know. So it talks about a Dutch slave ship that they called the Oak Tree. And that being done 
as stated in the year 1658. So now, if you're already reading in one book that the Dutch already had what we call Manhattan, which is part of now New York City, in 1613 as a slave colony, and then they have what we keep on talking about, the Dutch West India Company already setting up things in what they call and refer to as the West Indies prior to 1630. These dates, 1613, 1625, 1630, becomes important. And this is why I'm crisscrossing and corresponding book to book. All right, now let's go back, if we will. Brothers and sisters, I have a book, same book here, um, History of Slavery, right, by Susan Everett. So let me just go, let's be the most high, and just sit there and just let this be brought out, if we will. We're going to go to page in this book here by Susan Everett. It is entitled, the book that is History of Slavery. And we're going to go, brothers and sisters, until page six, page, pardon me, page 32. And here is what we see in this particular aspect right here. All right, let's go on, because we have a lot of references to bring out in this presentation. Because they want to sit there and show a mean presenting a lie. We're going to get it to Anthony Johnson. And then they want to sit there and show the concept of saying that the people didn't come um, against their volition. But let's, let's read the most high. Let's get this thing done. All right? So in this particular book right here, here is what we read. It says the following. All right? The Dutch West India Company formed in 1621 took 15,430 slaves to Brazil by 1613 23 sorry and in 1646 the first black slaves were landed in the earliest Dutch settlements in America New Amsterdam on the tip of Manhattan. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, I work by that area, by Fulton, Wall Street, Broadway, West Broadway, I'm going to just leave it at that, in geographic ways, <clears throat> by where they have what they call the slave wall and the slave quarters. Wall Street got that name because they used to sit there and sell black people, and they used to have black people lined up on the wall and say, no, this is Wall Street. That's right by the water. Not too, too, too far from what they call Ellis Island. So for those who are familiar with geography can gain an understanding concerning what I am speaking of. All right? Now, in this very same book here, here's a painting of them, the Dutch selling our ancestors as slaves. This is coming from the same book. This is a painting that was done. And if we look, 1643, the date. Very, very, very important in what we're talking about. Says what? Slave training started almost immediately. In 1646, the first cargo of blacks to be sold as slaves arrived in New Amsterdam from Brazil. See? They took them first to Brazil in what they call the Dutch West India Company and then had them from Brazil being brought over to what we now call Manhattan. Okay? So... Let that please, brothers and sisters, be noted and understood in what we're talking about in this presentation, all right? So, moving along, and it says the following. But imperial expansion was precarious, was a precarious activity. In the 1660s, a roistering British captain, Robin, Hol Robin Holmes, temporarily captured the Dutch ports in West Africa, except for El Minor, an act meant promptly by Michel Reiter, sorry if I pronounced the name wrong, who seized and recaptured every post held by the English except Cape Coast Castle. You know why I read that part right there? Because I wanted to show the evidence that you have the British and the English buying and fighting over the slave trade. So this is why we have to know why they keep on pushing the 1619 date. It's dated simply because of the fact that in 1607, you had it to where that's when the English set up their colony in what we call Virginia of today. Yet the slave trade in the same places was going on prior to the English setting up their legal colony. All right, so let that be noted. It says in 1664, the English 
captured New Amsterdam and renamed it New York. These incidents said these incidents were two direct causes of the Dutch English War of 1665 through 1667. When peace came, Holland ceded New York and acquired the then British outpost of Suriname. That is in now in what we call South America, Dutch Guyana, in its place. This was to remain the major Dutch colony in the New World. So basically what the author, Suzanne Everett, right there is pointing out is the fact that the Dutch lost, if you will, put it in that terminology, what we call the place of New York and ceded it to the British and then had their thing going on in Suriname. So that's very important to let that be noted and understood in history. Okay, let's continue on in our presentation. Okay. I want to go back into this book here, The Slave Trade by Hugh Thomas. Right? And we're going to go, brothers and sisters, on page 171. Here's what we read. Still, most slaves taken to New Holland. That is to say, New Holland being what later on became New England. Right? Boston, New York, Connecticut, Vermont, New Hampshire area. Okay? Still, most slaves taken to New Holland then average 1500 a year in the late 1630s continue to be captured at sea from Portuguese ships. So I wanted this to be read for another edification purpose. All right? It distinctly says, for those following along, it says continue to be captured at sea from Portuguese ships. Sorry about that if it's too dark. But the Dutch was capturing Portuguese slave ships. And as we read in a book entitled Black Cargoes by Daniel Mannix and William Coley, you sit there and see that the Dutch and the English were fighting, and now we see that the Portuguese and the Dutch were fighting one with another. All control to gain, that is, control of what we understand and call the slave trade. So these nations, when you sit there and speak about it, they don't deny it. It's only people like Andrew Jackson and then later on who want to sit there and try to push and promote the idea that the slave trade did not happen. So just wanted to go over those particular references right there for edification purposes. All righty. Can I be heard, brother? L loud and clear. Good, brother. All right. Now let's continue on. Brothers and sisters, in this same book here entitled The Slave Trade by Hugh Thomas, page 172, here is what we read. The Danes, that is to say the people of the Danish people, right? The Danes soon became keen to found an Africa company of their own. And in 1625, a Dutch merchant settled in Copenhagen, settled in Copenhagen. The guy's name is Johanna de Willem, spelt last name W-I-L-L-U-M. It says this. He received a license to operate in the West Indies, Brazil, Virginia, and Guinea, a vast chain of territories which, however, in the 17th century seemed to be one. So we have it to where, in the year 1625, the Dutch is recorded as having what they would like to call a license to sit there and trade slaves off from Guinea to Brazil, to the West Indies, and to Virginia. So, that's very important to have that to be noted and understood. So, we already went over the dates that we were going to sit there and keep on harping on for edification purposes. Now, let's get, for those following along, the meat into what we're talking about. Let's go back, if we will, into this book here called Black Cargoes. Because we're going to use college references to let our point be noted and understood. In the introduction to this book, Black Cargoes, here is what we read. In part, okay, it says the following. The Dutch asserted that French slavers were devious and cruel. The French said that the English were brutal and that the Portuguese were not only brutal but incompetent. The English laughed at the French for being excitable and at the Portuguese for baptizing whole shiploads of slaves before taking them to Brazil. So this right here is coming from the book entitled Black Cargoes.
This book, as stated, was written back in the 1960s. All right? Now, in this same book, because we read already, as just noted, the Portuguese, the English, the French, and the Dutch, these were some of the main nations that was during the situation of the slave trade. Now, let's go, if you will, brothers and sisters, into what is referred to, same book, same reference, right? I want to go to the same book, page 50, so that way we can gain an understanding concerning what we're speaking on, all right? And it reads as follows. This right here is very important to our black West Indian brothers and our black American brothers. Please pay attention to this, brothers and sisters, all right? And it says the following. It made the slave trade a seeming necessary for the New World, and especially for the West Indies. It was in 1605 that the English laid claim to Barbados. 1605, the English laid claim to Barbados, their first possession in the Caribbean area. Later, it will be called the mother of the West Indian Sugar Islands, the first English Settlers who began to arrive 20 years later cultivated their own small holdings and raised a diversity of crops, tobacco, cotton, indigo, and ginger. What? They had cotton grown inside the West Indies? Yeah. So the point I'm getting to is you have it to where, unfortunately, you have some black people from America, and some black people from the West Indies who still unfortunately have like a slave-like type of mind. Oh, back home in my country, this, that, and the third. No, let it be noted, back home in the islands, the British was oppressing you. Okay, so that's the point. I wanted to sit there and let that be driven home. All right, so now in this same particular situation that we're reading, I want to now get into the meat of what we're talking about concerning West India or West Indian Islands, quote-unquote. I have a book here for edification purposes. Now, I mentioned these people before called the Maroons, and this book here is called The Maroons of Jamaica, 1655 to 1796. This book here was shown to me as an Old Testament Israelite from a um, brother, I ain't going to mention his name for um, protection purposes, but the guy in Hashaba, a camp now located in the south, Mavis C. Campbell, and the elder, to me that is, who showed me, he was from Jamaica himself. In this particular book, I want to read just a couple of pages out of it. So that way we begin to see what in the world was going on and what in the world we was talking about. Because earlier we read that the people, and what we call before the Mayflower, that some of these people ran out into their own fields and mountains and established communities. And one of them, that became noted is the people that we call being the Maroons of Jamaica. First, um, if, correct me if I'm wrong, it was headed by a lady that they call Nani or Nanny, and she is on the Jamaican currency to this day. Her successor was a guy named Akapong, and then his um, comrades and successors were people like Kujo, Leonard Parkinson, so forth and so on. And it's actually the guy here, um, Leonard Parkinson, is the guy that we see pictured right here on a particular cover. You see, this is about the Maroons in Jamaica. Now, for those interested, there were Maroons in Brazil, there were Maroons in Virginia, there were Maroons in Guyana, there were Maroons in Mississippi. So like the term Hicksos is a generic term given to somebody by somebody else, so is the term Maroons, meaning those who are runaways or those who escape. All right, so let that be noted. So I want to sit there and continue on in this particular presentation concerning this. On the introduction part on page 7, here is what we read, and it says the following. It was in Panama that the Cimarrones, the Maroons, wrecked their greatest devastation on the Spanish Empire. When you go into your own sources, it was in the year 1526 that the slave trade already commenced by the Spanish and the black people and Indians that is to say, in the island that we call Panama of today, that they decided to sit there and rise up against the oppressors. Then it goes on to say the following. The period of the greatest harassment was between the 1540s and the 1570s. <clears throat> As my brother Mikael would say, <clears throat> therefore, we need to kill the 1619 date. The period of the greatest harassment 
was between the 1540s and the 1570s. As the British were soon to complain in Jamaica that they feared the Maroons more than they feared the Spaniards. So also the complaint of the Spaniards at the time, fearing more the blacks than the British. This is what happens when you go, brothers and sisters, into the book and the scriptures, not to renege, but yeah, I'm going to quote the Bible, um, in the book of Mika, where it says the remnant of Jacob shall be like a lion among the people in the forest. Because when our people rose up against their oppressors, there was nobody to stop them when they came right down into it. Read about the situation with the Satla Overture in Haiti. The guy that they call Daga of Trinidad. The guy that they call Chamba in the West Indies. Read about Gabriel Prosser in the United States. Nat Turner in the United States. Devon Vizi in the United States. All right, so let's move on. And it says the following concerning this kind of matter. Because I don't want to have it presented that our people were just like, oh, I is a slave, and that's just my life. Nah. Judah and his brothers was rising up during that enslavement too and, and, and killing their slave masters. I right, so let that be noted. Same book here as entitled, all right, um, Maroons of Jamaica. We're going to go now, brothers and sisters, to page 14 and read the following, and here is what we see. Although they, speaking of the Spaniards, although they had occupied Jamaica for nearly a century and a half, that is to say, since the year 1509. Now, when you go into Eric Williams' book entitled Documents of West Indian History, he was the former Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. May he rest in peace. He died in the early 1980s. All right. Now, had the West Indian Islands took his advice in the 70s and in the 60s and running all the West Indian Islands to unite and become one, our people in the West Indies probably not to sound harsh, probably be better off than they are now. Because now what winded up happening is you got to keep on dealing in business and currency with the European nations. By Jamaica saying, nope, I'm doing me. By um, St. Dominica saying, I'm going to do me. By Nevis and Montserrat saying, I'm going to do me. And by Trinidad saying, we're going to do our own thing. Had you took the advice of the elder, you probably, and our people probably would have been better off. Because not to sound harsh, but we're going to talk Israel, we talk real. Black people from the West Indies say something very true about black Americans. And it's not the saying that they say, oh, black Americans are lazy, because they say that too in certain quarters. But the terminology I'm talking about, because I used to court with sisters and date sisters from the islands. When you go in their homes and what they say about many of our people from North America is true. We don't pass nothing down to our kids. Black Americans are being noted as never wanting to buy a house. They're okay with just being in a room or an apartment. That is a fact, because that's what happened even in many of our immediate families. So the point I'm saying is that, and this is not to sound harsh or disrespectful, had our brothers and sisters in the islands heeded to the advice of Eric Williams and then in turn helped their brothers and sisters in the cities of the states of the United States, then we all would have came as a conglomerate. And that's what Marcus Garvey was trying to do. And that's why they tried to sit there and say, oh, he was a thief and he was a womanizer and we want to sit there and deport him. The man, may he rest in peace, died in 1940. The man was ahead of his time, as many people speak on. All right, so let that be noted. They systematically and on purpose set that up. Malcolm X's parents, Earl, and I forgot his mother's name, but his father's name was Earl. And Luis, I think his mother's name was, may they all rest in peace. They were workers for Marcus Garvey. You understand? And for those who are familiar with the history, they were knowledgeable Israelites that was in the mix with Marcus Garvey. Had we took in the advice of our elders, as even the house of Israel, or thus us saying that we are the Israelites from the black Jew era, we probably, at the Israelite camps, will be a lot better off than we are now. I want to state what I just said on purpose. Had our brothers and the sisters in the West Indies took the advice of Eric Williams and had the house of Israel and the Israelites take the advice of people such as Rabbi Matthews and Rabbi Ford and Rabbi Brooks in the black Jew era in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, we would have been better off as Israelite congregations than we are today. 
That's just being real. All right. So let's move on in this particular presentation. This is speaking about the Maroons of Jamaica. All right. Now we're going to go back in this part right here. And it says the following. When the Spaniards got there in 1509, the British noticed that the country had remained underdeveloped a century and a half later and underpopulated. One source said that not 100th part of the plentiful land was in cultivation when the British took possession. That is to say that when the British took over what we call now the island of Jamaica, which the Arawak people before that called it the place of Aksamaka. When you go into Eric Williams' book, Documents of West Indian History, he gets into that. All right? So it says that most of the places there were not cultivated. Then it also says in part on page 15, the Spaniards did fall victim at least to some of their slaves. So I just want to sit there and have that to be noted. Another part in the same book reads as follows. Reports of maroon society, pardon me, reports of maroon successes and plundering and burning plantations, capturing slaves and killing British officers who ventured out too far into the woods, such as Trelawney and so forth and so on, continued to reach the British governor named the Oily. That is D apostrophe O-Y-L-E-Y. So I just wanted to have it to be noted that both during the Spaniard occupation that our people in the island of Jamaica was going and rising up against the oppressors and brothers and sisters that when the British took over, our people were still rising up against the oppressors. Now, for those who are knowledgeable in certain aspects, and there is a club in the school I work in called the Dread Club. There was a difference of opinion between calling it Dread or Dreadlock. And majority of the people were saying that when the terminology Dreadlock came about was due to the fact when the people that were in the mountains such as in Trelawney or Maroon Town later on, such as in a place called St. Anne and St. Elizabeth in Jamaica, such as when they did the raids in Jamaica in a place called St. Catherine, such as when they sat there and rose up against their oppressors going as far um, east of the island as far as Kingston and so forth and so on. And when the people that was in a place called Port-au-Prince and Jack Mel and Okai and so forth in what you call the island of Haiti, when they went up into the mountains there, and the people that was in Brazil in a place called Palmares, and the Maroons that was there in what you call Bahia, which is another place in Brazil, and the Maroons that was in a place that you call Virginia, and in Mississippi, when they went up into the mountains and into the woods, they locked their hair. When the Europeans saw them, the Europeans was in dread of them. So now that has been the term, being scared of them, because dread means fright or to be afraid of. That's when the European man saw them. They said, though, they were in dread. That's where the terminology dread lock and roots came from. The people locked their hair. It's not a proper term to call people with locks in their hair dreads. They're not scary. They were just scary to the Europeans because the European did not know what in the world he was looking at. And when they come in with them in the islands, as they call it, the machete, or that is to say a machete, and rising up against their oppressors, yeah, that will sit there and bring dread and fear. So, as it says in the scriptures, let fear and dread fall upon them. By the greatness of that arm, may they be still as a stone. That's what happened when our people rose up against their oppressors in the islands and in North America. So that's something I wanted to sit there and let that be noted and pointed out. All right, continuing on in this presentation, if we will, I want to go back, if you will, into the book called Black Cargoes. Now, I'm trying in this particular thesis, reach out to my brothers and sisters in what we call the West Indies on purpose, okay? And here is one part. Here is what we read. Check this part out. I pointed this out in a documentation I did on my YouTube channel, which is also on my Facebook wall, entitled Diaspora of Israel. I read the same thing I'm about to read now. Here's what it says. In the West Indies, right, where Basel Negroes were cheap, these considerations were not of prime importance. But, here we go, but the Virginia colonists had to repurchase their Negro slaves from the West Indies in the early days, and hence a Negro represented a considerable investment. The Virginia colonists repurchased 
their Negroes from the West Indies. So you had the guy, like my teacher pointed out, during the slave trade, if you will. One brother went to Jamaica. His sister went to Trinidad. Their baby brother went to Virginia. Their cousin biologically went to North Carolina. And their and his sister went to the island of what you call Dominica. And their mother was taken to Guyana and their father was dropped off by the Spaniards in Florida. That's how the slave trade went. You understand? Very important to be noted. We just read in that book that the Virginia colonists, because remember they first set up their colony in 1607, they had to repurchase their Negro slaves from the West Indies. When you go into a book entitled, and the book is entitled The Black Book. That's the name of the book. And in that book, it speaks about how George Washington had a slave named George and a slave named Tom and so forth and so on. And how he, in the year 1768, used to sit there and slay black people back and forth between what you call the United States and the West Indies. So this right here, we're coming collegiate right now. So let it be noted and understood. Continuing on in the next presentation concerning this matter. I have a book here entitled The Slave Trade. Once again, um, we're going to go this time into page 261. So we can sit there and let that be noted and understood. Page 261 concerning this kind of matter. All right? And this gets interesting. Here we go. New York. New York, New York, you know, take a big app, bite out the apple. The apple they was biting into was the black man. New York was far behind the ports of New England. Only 14 voyages to Africa for the purpose of buying slaves seem to have been made from there between 1715 and 1747. The ships traveling across the Atlantic and directly back. The merchants concerned including included descent, descendants of the old Dutch families such as the Shorelers and Van Horns, but also Anglo-Saxon or Scottish ones, such as the Levenstings and Walters. The Levenstein family in New York. Brothers and sisters was involved in the slave trade. How does that become significant for those in New York? Because Levenstein Street is downtown Brooklyn. That's where the fire department is. That's where the police headquarters is, and so forth and so on. That's where the Transit Authority headquarters is at, too. Livingston Street, by the courthouse, named after the family that was in, got involved in the slave trade. Get that book, Hidden History of New York. Let's move on. The ships traveling across the Atlantic and directly back, okay? And it says, alliances of the two social groups occurred, as when Arnott Schuyler and John Walter of New York jointly invested in what is referred to as the Catherine, which brought back 260 slaves from Africa in the 1730s. What I just read about the Dutch people, still in New York, because even though, as you read, that they gave up Manhattan to the British, they were still involved in business. So let that be noted in history. So in the 1730s, Directly from New York, they had the slave trade going. When I personally found that out, I was actually shocked because as a child, I was taught about slavery being in the South and slavery not really being in the North, and the North was the place the slaves wanted to go, and so forth and so on. But such was not truly the case when you get down into the history of it. Now, the United States was founded in what they call 1776. So now when they sit there and take that legal date of 1776, the records that speak about the slave trade prior to that in what we still call in the same vicinity in the area of 17, of, of, of the colonies, right? They try to sit there and then try to deny that by saying the United States didn't have a part of it. That was the colonies. See, now we're different. We're now the United States. We're not 13 separate colonies. That's part of the game that they played to try to disassociate themselves from the wickedness that they was about. Remember, as stated, Andrew Jackson said, we need to do everything we can to try to hide the fact of what we've done, been engaged in. 
So, in continuing on in this particular subject, I want to sit there and for edification purposes, if we will, show this particular aspect and this particular thing right here. This, brothers and sisters, is for edification purposes what we will sit there and refer to as the slave ship. We already went over this before. All right, so I just want to sit there and have this to be seen. This is what happened with some of the people after they didn't die in transit when they was being made to pick cotton. Now, we went over the fact that cotton was also grown in Brazil, and as you all know, they still got cotton plantations in South Carolina and Suffolk, Virginia as well. And this here is a picture dated from the era of what happened in Georgia with black people being enslaved by the colonists. So I just wanted to sit there and have that brothers and sisters, to be noted and shown. There are all kinds of references concerning this kind of matter. You got painters that talked about it. You got people dated from that era that spoke about it. So what is this new era generation of people coming up talking about the slave trade that happened? And of course, why did I sit there and drive the West Indian aspect so hard? Is because when they talk about slavery didn't happen here, or slavery never existed, or the Atlantic slave trade never happened, they trying to sit there and focus on the black man in America, not realizing that the early Virginia colonists got most of their slaves from the West Indies. And we already read that the Dutch already had people in the 1630s in what we call Manhattan, in the 1630s as slaves taken to Manhattan from Brazil. The people in Brazil mainly came from Africa in the place that we call Angola. So let that be noted. Now, certain types of European nations, quote unquote, favored to get certain kinds of people brought over to the Western Hemisphere. You understand? You had the French that was like um, Senegal. You had the English that liked to sit there and deal in what you call Ghana. You understand? Then you had the Portuguese who mainly liked to deal in Angola. You understand? Then the Spanish that liked to deal in what you call Nigeria. Now, these things I just stated, Spanish, Nigeria, English, Ghana, French, Senegal, Portuguese, Angola, this right here is just a general synopsis of how some of the aspects of the slave trade was divided up. You understand, among different European nations. But in your own time, if you get that book, Black Cargoes, as we've been noticing, the author of that same book, when you read it on your own time, just to get there and give food to the people, you got to give, as the brothers in the AOC, the brothers who call themselves the ambassadors of Christ, point out, you got to sit there and give the people, not to be disrespectful, before you give them the meat, you got to give them the milk. So anybody interested, you can get that same book online entitled Black Cargoes, The History of the Atlantic Slave Trade, because I got two copies of it. One I acquired, I'll leave it at that, on how I got it, and the other book, that is to say I ordered on Amazon. Okay, so we're going to sit there and leave that particular aspect in that particular case. If we will, brothers and sisters, I want to go into the source that we were going to get into, if we will. I have a book here this is a, without a shadow of a doubt, a full-fledged college book. This is what they use in what they call the college course AFN-123, African American Studies 123 college course. All right? And this is called From Slavery to Freedom, written by, if we will, all right? Hope Franklin, and Alfred Moss. You can also get this book also online. All right, now, I want to sit there and show a picture in this, if we will. So that way we begin to see a physical representation of what we've been going over and over and over and who took who, where, and, and so forth and so on. In this book right here, page 46, right, here's what we see in this picture right here concerning the slave trade. Here's the, 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 the Africa, the lines that you show concerning the slave trade. Going over here west, West Indies, Brazil, from here to North America. It's stated in the book The Slave Trade by Hugh Thomas, New York directly only made 14, but 14 is enough. You understand? So going all the way through there so you can see the picture that we're speaking of. The people that was taken from Africa that we went over earlier to Europe. Because, as stated, it was the guy, Bartolome Las Casas, that was a Spaniard, right? That said, don't enslave the natives that's here. 
go over way across here and bring the people from here way over here. So that was done, and we call it in the year 1518. Then the Portuguese brought directly from there to Brazil in what we call 1538. But we have to sit there and now focus on this for a particular reason. Now, I deliberately in the notes, blessed be the most high, sat there and picked to go over the Portuguese issue at first, then the Dutch issue, and then to go over the British issue. Because if you're going to talk about the British involvement, then we get into a very hardcore crux of it. In the year 1807-1808, they tried to make it illegal for the slave trade. The British basically was trying to get a monopoly on it. Like, okay, we're going to sit there and just stop the Spaniards and the Portuguese and everything of that sort. Amistad, even a movie that was made based upon it, dated to the era of 1839. The Amistad was the second ship that the, some of them same captains was brought on. The first ship that they was brought on was a Portuguese slave ship called the Tacora. Once they got dropped off in Cuba, it was intended to then go to the United States. Why in 1839 are they bringing black people as captives to the United States off of the shore of Long Island if the British, which had monopoly in what we call the United States, banned the slave trade in the year 1807 and 1808? Why, according to some saying that slavery ended in 1808, did Nat Turner in the 1830s rise up against his oppressors? Why did, in the year 1861, the slave ship, later on called the Wanderer, became used by the people in the, in the um, Northern Army when they was fighting the Confederates in the South in the Union, um, Union and Confederate Army, what they called the Civil War? I have to sit back and ask these kind of questions because records upon records upon records show exactly what it is. So this lie that they're trying to tell little black and Hispanic children over in what you call the state of Texas needs to end. Now, we was going to do this presentation on Friday um, with the brother Basim, but I said, you know what? No, let me get to the college and get more books on this and get the, the things more settled together so that way when we do this, it would sit there and be flawless. You know what I'm saying? So we can sit there and present this type of thing um, pretty much unchallenged. In concluding this particular subject, all right, I like to go, if you will, back into the book entitled Black Cargoes, right? And on page 54, this right here shuts down the whole concept of the 1619 date. We're only going to spend about maybe 20 more minutes and just wrap this up. It is entitled Black Cargo, History of the Atlantic Slave Trade, right? Here's what it says. Nobody knows who, were the, who was the first Negro slave to reach the mainland of the New World, but he must have arrived here at an early date. Balboa had 30 Negroes with him when he discovered the Pacific. Balboa, the European explorer, that dated to 1513. Let's go on. Cortez brought 300 slaves to the conquest of Mexico. By 1530, there were so many Negro slaves in Mexico that they were plotting an uprising. Now, giving a shout out in respect to the brother Alazar Ben Lawa, the brother um, who has the Sakari YouTube situation, him and I were speaking back and forth in reference about the slave trade that was going on in Mexico. And I wanted to sit there as him and I mutually agreed that there were so many uprisings under the Spanish hegemony when the black people and the natives that were in that same land was raising up against the Europeans to where there's no way in the world you're going to sit there and say that our people is not among what you call the people of the Hispanics. So let's move on. All right. It says the following. By 1530, there were so many Negro slaves in Mexico that they were plot that they plotted an uprising. When Pizarro was murdered by his own men in Peru, his body was carried to the cathedral by his Negroes. There were also Negroes with Alvarado when he went to Quito, Ecuador in the year 1534. The first Negro slaves were brought to Brazil in 1538. By the 17th century, that is to say the 1600s, 44,000 were being imported annually. The first reliable census in 1798 
showed 1,582,000 slaves and 406,000 free Negroes and a total population of 3,250,000, that being only in Brazil. Probably the first Negro slaves to arrive in the United States mainland were imported by Lucas Vasquez de Alon in 1526. Or, all right. See, the reason why I wanted to end off in this particular note is because I wanted to sit there and finally, brothers and sisters, smash the 1619 date that many of our people were on. And it's not to say that 1619 did not happen and that it was not significant because it certainly was. But we just read right here. It says what? Probably the first Negro slaves to arrive on the United States mainland were imported by Lucas Vasquez de Elon in 1526. When you go, brothers and sisters, in your own time and look up history of slavery, and they start you at 1619, for the Negro enslavement, they're taking you to the British record of the United States. They're not telling you full hardcore about the guy that we went over before called John Hawkins and what he did and what we know and understand prior to 1619 in the 1560s. They're not talking about what we read earlier in Barbados when the people of the British had control of the island of Barbados. When they give you 1619, they are giving you a colonized date that the Dutch brought black people as slaves to a guy named John Wolf. Yet we see other records that speak about black people being slaves in the same mainland of the United States dated to the 1500s. 1526, remember we just read that it said they were imported. Where were they imported from? This guy that we just read about, Lucas Vasquez de Elon, was a guy that was working for Charles the king of Spain, and he got permission from Charles, the king of Spain, that is to say Charles V, pardon me, the king of Spain, that is, and he had commission for him to go and take black people from Dominican Republic, as it's called today, part slash Haiti, to what we call now the state of South Carolina. South Carolina had black slaves in the year 1526. Let's continue on. There were Negro slaves on other North American Spanish sediments. You notice it distinctly says Spanish sediments because they always tried to sit there and wash their hands by saying, oh no, that wasn't us, the British. And then after 1776, they tried to say, oh no, that wasn't us, the United States. Those are the colonies. But we're going to bust all that up tonight. Bless me the most high. There were Negro slaves in other North American Spanish sediments. From its founding in 1565 to the end of the Civil War in 1865, a period of exactly three centuries, there were slaves in St. Augustine, Florida. So from 1565 until 1865, are we serious? 1619 is not the accurate date. All right, we already proved that. Now, so... From 1526, black people was being shipped as slaves from what you call today Dominican Republic slash Haiti, what they call Hispanolia back then. That was done by the guy, um, Lucas Vasquez de Elon, by the orders of King Charles V. We already went over the situation with John Hawkins, who was the worker of Elizabeth I, who was the daughter of Henry VIII. Okay, so let that be noted. Prince Henry the Navigator in the 14th Hundreds, that is the one who sent out his expedition when the Portuguese first captured slaves from Africa or black people from Africa as captives and then make them um, into slaves in what you call Lisbon um, in a place called Portugal today. So these things are just certain things to let it be noted and understood. All right. So, brothers and sisters, in concluding this particular subject, if we will, I want to go over a particular matter that we said we want to talk about. And it's concerning this meme that a lot of people present. And I spoke about it in my YouTube channel, and I'm going to speak about it now, and I spoke about it on Facebook, Blessed Be the Father. This meme, brothers and sisters, is used, not to sound racial, but by the white man, when he wants to sit there and say and try to equate himself away from being a slave master. 
this guy that they have here pictured, first, where did you get the picture from? Was it painted or sculpted? Because photography in the United States with the camera did not come until the 1820s. And it was John Quincy Adams in the 1840s, after his presidency, mind you, that was one of the first noted presidents of the United States to have his picture taken by camera, by film. So therefore, from George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and James Monroe, all of the first five presidents of the United States, they all got their pictures that you see today by paintbrush on canvas or by sculpture. So we got to ask then, the first president listed, George Washington, because John Hansen was not the first president of the United States. He was part of the Liberian people that was a president there. The black guy you see on the $2 bill was not a president of the United States. He was just an important figure. Like Benjamin Franklin was not a president of the United States. He was just an important figure. This is dated to the 1650s. This is dated to 1650s. Who did this picture of this guy by sculpture or by paint in the 1650s? They just put a picture of any black man that they could find to try to promote this lying meme that has been going around. All right, so let's go here. It says, the first slave owner in America was not only a black man, he went to court and demanded it, named Anthony Johnson. Now, there's a couple of things to point out because in the record that you see inside of America concerning this guy, can I be heard? Can I be heard? Yes, good brother. Loud and clear. It good. took me a second Thank to you. mute my mic. Go for it. Thank you. He was named before the terminology Anthony Johnson. He was named Antonio the Negro. Antonio is a Spanish slash Portuguese name. We already went after record after record after record that the Dutch captured slaves from the Portuguese. Is that according to the record, he was a man on a man on record named Antonio the Negro, and that he directly came from the place that we today call Angola, shipped by the Portuguese and then taken over by the Dutch, and then the Dutch brought him over to what we call the place called Virginia today, and that he had a wife and kids. So am I saying that there were no black people that were slave masters? Yeah. Niggers existed. There were black people who were slave masters. Just like there were black men today who sell drugs. But that doesn't negate the fact that everybody know who was a hustler back in the 1980s, there's a DVD out that they sell in the street. It's called Getting Rich in the Reagan Era. Every big hustler in the drug game know what happened when Reagan was in office and when Bush Sr. took over and how the price of a kilo of cocaine done changed. So yet there are black wicked men. They're all black people who have enslaved black people. I'm not denying that. My point is just as much as there were black drug dealers, we got to know the source of where that came from. Does that alleviate or exonerate the black wicked ones? No, it does not. Am I saying that Anthony Johnson was not a slave master? I'm not saying that, that he was not. This is what I'm saying, that this meme, nonetheless, is still a lie. And here we go, right here. It says this, and Anthony Johnson, the pioneer of American slavery. You see that, people? It says what? Pioneer? Now, he's according to that, he is the pioneer of American slavery in what we call 1650s. I have, for college references, a book that they sell. I actually bought this when I was a student in the college from the same colors I actually work in, but that's neither here nor there. It is entitled the American Heritage College Dictionary, right? 
Now, I use this for edification purposes. And here is what we read. Okay, brothers and sisters? It says the following. Pioneer, definition number one. One who goes into unknown or unclaimed territory to settle. Definition number two. One who opens up new ideas of thought, research, or development. So, let's see if this guy here, Anthony Johnson, who got his English name when he was in, enslaved by the English, and then, because he was named Antonio the Negro, so he was a slave prior to being brought to Virginia. Let's see if he was the pioneer, because it said a pioneer is one who brings new thought into development. Let's see even what this lion meme gives a half-truth in what it says. All right, and we're going to conclude with this right here. It says, in 1654, it was time for Anthony to release John Kayser, a black indentured servant. Instead, Anthony told Kayser that he would extend, that he was extending his time. Kayser left and became employed by the free white man, Robert Parker, right? Then he goes on to sit there and say this following in this lying meme. Anthony Johnson sued Robert Parker in the Northampton court in 1654. In 1655, the court ruled that Anthony Johnson could hold John Kayser indefinitely. The court gave judicial sanction, pay attention, because this is the half-truth right here. The court gave judicial sanction for blacks to own a slave of their own race. Thus, Kayser became the first permanent slave and Johnson the first slave owner. This is dated to when? 1655. Brothers, sisters, if I didn't sit there and become redundant, and showing from black cargoes by William Mannix, if I didn't become redundant in showing the slave trade by Hugh Thomas, if I didn't show the reference about the Dutch in that book, History of Slavery by Susan Everett, and you got the new generation that refused to pick up a book and read, and they're going by memes on the internet, because all you got to do, I got this picture, Anthony Johnson, slave master, and this picture came up. That's how I printed it out. So, this meme has been going around and has been poisoning a lot of people's minds. So let's sit there and go, because a lot of people don't read books. They go by memes. They like to watch films and don't want to sit there and go pen, pad, paper. See, not to sound haughty or arrogant. See, this is I want something I want to sit there and show, if we will, for edification. This is how I personally study. You see all of that? Pen, paper, notes, pen, paper. All of this is about the presentation tonight. Pen. Paper, all right? Pen, paper. All of that right there is notes and side notes I incorporated concerning this. You see? Look, brothers and sisters, if you will, this is called, and I don't mean to be funny, this is called a pen. Do you realize as many people don't want to sit there and take notes like that? Let's just sit there and go on Facebook and go on YouTube and post a meme and post a picture and just sit there and come up with some words and not even realizing and understanding that there's no way in the world they could have gotten adequately this picture of this guy that they have right here. Because we have to sit there and let it be noted. Now, in this particular lion, half truth meme, it says, political correctness must die, whoever put that on there. But how is he the pioneer of American slavery when we know good and well he went according to that same meme he went to the Northampton court. Who were the people who decided his case? Were they black or were they white? Were they slaveholders themselves or so forth? Because there's no way in the world, according to the same meme, that he got judicial reasoning. What it says, it said judicial sanction. Judicial means of the court of a judge. So if they gave him judicial sanction, that means there's no way in the world that he was the pioneer in it because they knew what in the world he was talking about when he wanted to keep his slave indefinitely. So the fact that he got judicial sanction shows that the people in the court 
knew what in the world was going on with keeping the slave permanently. So there's no way in the world, in light of that, that that man is what you would call a pioneer. He was not the pioneer of American slavery. All right? And for edification purposes, let's read definition number two of pioneer in the same dictionary. Again, it concludes, one who opens up new areas of thought. We already went over the situation with the Dutch and the British and their arguments and their fights and their contention. So that's done in New York, 1613, as we went over in that book that we see right here, entitled The Slave Trade by Hugh Thomas. You can get the same book, less than $30 online, if you will. The same book right here talked about them being in what we call New York. New York is part of what you call the United States. But see, they slick. Because they tried to sit there and that stated, no, those were the colonists. We're now the United States of America. Then they'll say, oh, no, those were the Dutch. That wasn't us. So how do you have the Dutch being in New York doing slave trading in the 1730s and the 1740s in the same state of New York? That's why reading is fundamental. So therefore, we have to know and understand that there's no way in the world that Anthony Johnson, though he may have not been the most pious and righteous of people, that there's no way in the world that he was the pioneer of American slavery. No way, shape, form, or fashion is that the case. Now, I hope what I was presenting was fully noted and understood and so forth and so on. Um, there will be, for edification purposes, a part two concerning this matter right here. Now, in the last two or so minutes, I want to read a book written by a black author in the 1880s. The name of this book here is entitled, and I quote, this book is Christianity, Islam, and the Negro Race, written by Edward Blyden. Now, blessed be the most high, not trying to sound funny or nothing, my current age of being 35 years old, I got this book when I was 15 with my allowance money. So this book I had in my possession, blessed be the most high, and we will call it for 20 years. And this is something I want to read concerning this. In this book here, Christianity, Islam, and the Negro Race, for all that the naysayers of the Bible and why we know good and well, just as much as the Bible been through the hands of the white man, so has our people been through the hands of the white man. So if we know can accept ourselves with certain things, then we can sit there and accept and know the scriptures with certain things. Did they take things out of our history? Yes. Were things taken out of the Bible? Yes. But we still accept ourselves and we've been through the same hands of the same white man who had the Bible in his possession. So I wanted to sit there for the naysayers, just read this particular part right here. This is coming from a slave master in the 1830s. And here is what it says, right? Pardon me, 1840s. If the slave is not allowed to read the Bible, the sin rests upon the abolitionists. This is saying that if the abolitionist is teaching the slave the Bible, it's a sin. That's not written in the Bible, though. But let's just go on. It says this. If the slave is not allowed to read the Bible, the sin rests upon the abolitionists, for they stand prepared to furnish him with the key to it. Let's go. Which will make it not a book of hope and love and peace, but of the spear, hatred, and blood. Ain't that what they say about the Israelites who teach on the corners? Those guys are full of hate. Y'all Israelites are full of hate. There's no love with you guys. And the Israelites quote, according to the same Bible, it's a time to love, it's a time to hate. It says hate the evil and love the good. So yes, we, the house of Israel, we hate the thing that Jenna did with the cross gender. We hate the fact that a brother is going to possibly be put in jail because he put to death a person that he had intimate relations with not realizing that the person was a transgender. We hate that. We hate the fact that I got to possibly send my daughter to private school because they trying to, on the low, push a homosexual agenda in the public school, in the fourth grade, 
my little girl who's nine years old is sitting up there talking about the other students who were taught and heard of what they call anal sex. My little baby is nine years old. They didn't say it to her, but she sat there and said to her mother that other students was talking about what they were being told in certain schools about anal sex. And this person does not even have a double digit at her beautiful age. Brothers and sisters, when I was nine years old, I knew about sexual activity, but I knew good or well my place, and I never mentioned anything of that sort. Because as a boy, a boy knows certain things. Girls, unless I'm mistaken, sisters, were not privy to that kind of stuff as boys talk among boys. But I got sisters, and from what I'm told, girls talk about that kind of stuff, just like boys talk about that kind of stuff, unbeknown to me when I was nine. So my point is this. Yeah, we hate certain things of that sort. We hate the fact that Israelites are called homophobic when the scriptures teaches you that a man and a male is not supposed to have intimate relations. When you go into Deuteronomy 23 in the Hebrew, verse 17 and 18, Lo tihyeh kwadeh shah me no Israel. There should not be a lesbian among the daughters of Israel, which they translate as female um, prostitute or female sodomite even when you go in the strong's concordance. So yeah, we have a problem with that. We hate that. We hate thieves. We hate liars. And as it says in Ezekiel, quoting the Bible, it said that the house of Israel shall loathe themselves of all the iniquities that they've done. Deuteronomy 32 says that the house of Israel concerning our enslavement will be dropped off to a no people, a people that is not, that which is not a people. You have to sit there and not be a people to sit there and say that homosexuality and their fighting for rights and black people fighting in the civil rights movement is equated to being the same because you chose to do cunnilingus with a woman and you a woman and you chose to do fellatio with a man and you a man. Nobody chose to be born being the raw color in this society. So there is no equation. All right. So let's continue on in this. And it says the following. If the slave is not allowed to read the Bible, the sin rests upon the abolitionists, for they stand prepared to furnish him with the key to it, which would not make it a book of hope and love and peace. Because when you don't read it and your ignorance is bliss, you're like, he so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Not realizing the world that he's talking about would have only been the Israelite world because that in the New Testament, is even who Yahweh Shai or Yahshua said he came for. I came not to nobody but the house of Israel. So that's even in the New Testament, coming from an Old Testament brother. Okay, let's move on. And it says this, not a book of hope and love and peace, but of despair, hatred, and blood, which would not convert the reader into a Christian, but a demon. That's right here in the same book, Christianity, Islam, and the Negro Race by Edward Blyden, in page 36, citing a man in the 1840s speaking about what would happen if the slave is taught the Bible. Nat Turner knew the Bible. He was a demon to them. Dan Vizi knew the Bible. He was a demon to them. The British, in concluding this in the last five minutes, thank the Most High for the brother Basim sending the show up. The British used to criticize the Portuguese in slavery because the Portuguese used to teach black people in slavery in Brazil how to read. And the British used to say to them, don't teach them Negroes how to read. Is you stupid? If you teach them how to read, then he'll become sad. And then you see in Brazil, they had more uprisers than anywhere else. As even a Hollywood-based movie, Roots, shows you. Says, why can't we teach them how to read? Well, a slave is ignorant. And he eats, he sleeps, and he's happy. You teach him how to read, he'll become most miserable. Even to this day, you sign something on the contract and be like, oh, I didn't know because you didn't read. Lack of reading will cause a lot of things. Brothers and sisters, you know the saying, you pay for what you don't know? That's a fact. Here I am calling myself trying to, not reading the literature carefully, I call myself trying to get a car, and everybody was telling me, brother, get a thing called the blue book concerning buying cars. 
and everyone, in all of the reading I love to do, for those who know me, know what it is, blessed be the Father, I was like, man, I just want to sit there. I saw that price on that call, not to be too personal. I knew what was in my account. I said, you know what? I can handle that. So I sit there and go and try to get the thing. They ran my social. They ran this. They ran that. Ran the credit and so forth and so on. They told me that this car does this and this car does that. Now, I'm not reading the fine line. There was an Israelite brother that was with me at the time. When we went to the car dealership, for those new, who know New York, we was over by, Has, um, by Hewlett as you go between Far Rockaway and um, Nassau County and New York State, um, New York City slash New York State, all right? So those who know, when you're going into Far Rockaway by public transportation, there's a lot of car dealerships out there. And me and the Israelite brother went out there, and he said, what is the APR, the EPA, or something of that sort. And the lady sat there and said, this guy knows what he's talking about. Me, I'm just like, wow, look at the car. It looks so pretty. Look at the account. It looks so nice. When they ran the social in my credit, it was like, you probably need somebody else to sign on it. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, I could probably ask this person or that person, not realizing what they just told me is going to now cost me more because I didn't have the credit, though I had some paper, money, currency, credit in the United States is treated different. So now, when they ran it, the brothers was heard from the lady, because I didn't understand. That's why all that getting get understanding. She said, it is 19.25 APR. That brother grabbed me by my arm and said, Yeshia, come on. We got to get up out of here. And the lady who is a sister just smiled like that brother did a study. And I'm like, what's wrong? All I heard was the number 19. He said, I you will be paid for that and the, uh, the interest for the rest of your life, brother. You didn't realize what was going on? I said, no. That's what happens when you're dealing with the meme like Anthony Johnson. Do you realize what was going on? A lot of people, no, because you didn't take the time out to read. Just like I didn't take the time out to understand what was going on with the call. So I put myself out there just for edification purposes to let it be noted that reading is very good. Now, just like they tell you, you can't learn math by uh, a calculator, you can't learn knowledge by just going on YouTube. I know this is going to be put online, but brothers and sisters, just like Basim said, we're going to show the books so you can sit there and read it in your own time if you care to do so. So I quoted black and white scholars. Hugh Thomas was a white man. I cited Eric Williams. He was a black man. So just to let it be noted, Susan Everett, that was a woman. So I just wanted to sit there and have that to be noted that we came full circle. Blessed be the most high. There will be a part two. Shalom. Kashub, we, we thank the we thank you for dedicating your time tonight to the people. We had a lot of people watching live had some people inboxing and complimenting while the presentation was live so uh, I know the people enjoyed it uh, prayerfully uh, they'll understand and it was it was very educational uh, definitely edifying before we sign off good brother why don't you let the people know where they can find you on Facebook your YouTube channel and if you wanted to give out an email address, and like I mentioned, when the video is done uh, uploading, I will include the books and the authors in the video description, and that will probably save you some uh, inboxed questions from uh, Facebook. But why don't you give out your information uh, one more time, good brother? All right, shalom. No problem. Can I be heard? Yes, you can. All right. Facebook, Kashub Danite, K-A-S-H-U-B, last name, Danite, D-A-N-I-T-E, Kashub Danite, open Facebook, okay, so it's really Kashub Historian Danite, but if you type in Kashub Danite, K-A-S-H-U-B, Danite, D-A-N-I-T-E, you will see that, YouTube channel, Moray Yeshaya, spelt as the following, M-O-R-E-H, Moray, Yeshaya, Y-E-S-H-I-A-H. So the whole YouTube channel is spelled as follows. M-O-R-E-H. Second word. 
Y E S H I A H. Email Moray Yeshaya at yahoo.com. No, sorry. YouTube, sorry, 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 sorry about that. Email is Moray1, M O R E H O N E, M O R E H O N E at yahoo.com. So that's the email, Moray1 at yahoo.com. The YouTube, Moray Yeshaya, and the Facebook, Kashub Danite. For those interested in getting um, further information on what we had went over this evening. And um, Basim, if you're available, let me know when, because as shown, there's a lot more notes concerning this matter. I went over the Portuguese and the Dutch and the English, but I did not go over the French and the Spanish as much in detail. That's to be in part two. And that's more extensive because they was involved in it more than the other nations in their own particular realm. So that's why I left that for part two. So hopefully, brother, we can link up and set that up in the future. And and you know, good brother, that's no problem. Uh, you have my direct line. Uh, you know how to get a hold of me at any time. We've been receiving a lot of compliments, uh, a lot of feedback from the lessons that you brought out. Uh, especially the two you did with the Mighty Hebrew. Uh, special thanks to him as well, the tribal minister, the Mighty Hebrew, good brother. And um, as always, we, we give thanks and, and honor and praise to the uh, Most High God, our Creator, Creator of heaven and earth and all things. And prayerfully, you will hear from us again soon. So with that, uh, we say shalom. Shalom.